The Vendorpedia platform is perps built to automate the third party risk life cycle with three core capabilities assessments and due diligence, global risk exchange, and vendor chasing services. Hello, and welcome to It Hurt Itself in Confusion No Distribute Scanners and Stealthy Malware. If you are joining us live, our speakers are in the slider discussion area right now answering any of your questions. If you have any audio or video issues, please click the technical support button below. I'd now like to turn it over to Liv, Liv Rowley and Matthew Gauthier for the presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. And thank you all for joining us for It Hurt Itself in Confusion, No Distribute Scanners, and Stealthy Malware. Uh, again, my name is Liv Rowley, and I'm a Threat Intelligence Analyst over here at BlueLiv. And I'm Mathieu Gauthier. I'm a Cybersecurity Analyst over at BlueLiv as well. So what are we going to be chatting about today? Uh, first off, we're going to start with a brief introduction to no distribute scanners, uh, or NDSs. So what are they? How do they work? Uh, next, we're going to talk about the different types of NDS services that we find available in the cybercriminal underground. And then we're going to talk about how these uh, NDSs are used by cybercriminals to commit cybercrime. And then we'll wrap this whole thing up with some key points for you all to uh, take away with you. OK, so let's talk about scan for you and DIN check. OK, imagine that you are this man here, Ruslan Bonders, and it is a lovely day in May of 2017 in Latvia, and suddenly you get a knock on the door, and you are picked up by law enforcement extradited to the United States. What was your crime? Let's talk. So Bonders here and his partner were running a no distribute scanner or an NDS known as scan for you scan for you was branded as virus total for crooks by the media, which I really like because I think it actually does a great job of explaining what these services are. scan for you was available, or was online rather, for eight years, which is a lengthy period of time for a cyber criminal service. Typically, this, um, the underground is pretty volatile. And by the time it was uh, seized by law enforcement, it had 30,000 registered users. So how does this story end uh, for Mr. Bonders here? Well, in the US, he received a 14-year prison sentence. Obviously, that's quite a lengthy time. And uh, that really should show you the impact and severity of these services and the role that they play in facilitating cybercrime. So where does that lead us now, right? Uh, there are many different, or well, there's a handful of different no distribute scanners or NDSs that are currently available, uh, which we will talk a bit about later. But kind of the top dog of the NDSs right now is DINCHEK. So DINCHEK is popular with both Russian and English speaking cyber criminals, as well as uh, tons of people from other linguistic communities as well. Uh, the site came online in uh, 2016 which meant that it was very well prepared to take over from scan for you when that was taken offline. And DINCHEK offers both static and dynamic scans of uh, malicious files. And we'll talk a bit about what that means later. OK, so no distribute scanners 101. What are these? So no distribute scanners or NDSs, um, and they're also sometimes known as counter AV as well. Uh, they are standalone websites. And by that, I mean that they aren't part of a forum or a software that you download. It's actually a website that you access, uh, and they have API access as well. What they do is that uh, they scan potentially malicious files against dozens of different antivirus products and then generate a report that is given back to the person scanning the file, telling you whether and how that file um, might have been detected. So the key here and what differentiates it from something uh, legitimate like virus total is that there is no feedback loop. So cyber criminals have disabled the feedback loop between the antivirus product and the antivirus company in order to ensure that this malware stays uh, stealthy and uh, you know, secret for as long as possible before being used in a campaign. Uh, the, so uh, the takeaway there is that these cyber criminals are really using security products to um, help themselves improve in their cyber crime. Uh, NDSs are advertised to cyber criminals. They're actively promoted on forums, and they are their cyber criminal products. 
So here we have an example of one NDS. This is CyberScanner, and you can see it's you know it's pretty intuitive, kind of user friendly. You can just drag and drop your file right into the site. It'll scan it and it'll give you a report. So here you have an example of uh, a little more complicated setting panel. This one is from Scan Heaven, I believe. You have a lot of options. For example, you have the choice of which uh, antivirus you want to pit your malware against. You can see uh, uh, Archibit, Avast, Avira, ton of them, depending on which one you want to test your malware against. And you have also several options, like enabling internet or not, deleting the zone identifier, disabling uh, the user access control. All of these little parameters and options are made to allow threat actors to have a more finely tuned control over the analysis, to have an analysis that is going to be actually closer to what they could encounter in the wild. So this is what this uh, setting panel is made for. If you take a look at the DINCHECK setting panel, you see more or less the same options, maybe even more uh, specific. For example, you can use DBG view to see how Windows reacts to your malware, or even uh, enable object linking and embedding. But one of the most interesting uh, features, sorry, for me, are the connection enabling or not. You can choose between blocking completely, whitelisting a few a handful of sites, for example, your command and control server, or fully enabling internet. Uh, fully enabling internet has actually kind of a cost, especially in scan heaven. I don't know if you see there was a little mention saying, if you enable internet, you find maybe distributed. Is that because a lot of AV products actually use cloud computing to do some more uh, heavy lifting operation like sandboxing to analyze some files further? That's what NDSs don't want. They do, didn't, do not desire that because this would uh, distribute the file of the threat actors that are paying them not to distribute them. So that's kind of the problem here. OK, let's take a look at the, at the different uh, NDS services. First and foremost, we need to uh, do a little bit of technique and explain what's the difference between static and dynamic analysis, actually. So uh, this stems from antiviruses and the way they analyze files. You have static analysis, which is basically an overview and an inspection of the format of your file, of how it is made. What is inside, for example, is there any string pattern that are indicative, like you have on the right, a Yara rule, made to detect uh, an OS 6 malware and name hidden Lotus. It's basically just going to open the file, search for some patterns, string patterns like this, and then give out if they are here or not. It can also inspect the format, seeing if the, for example, the portable executable is signed or not, or if the entropy is not considered normal or not in the form in the file, which could indicate, for example, that the file is packed or maybe encrypted. On the other hand, dynamic analysis is really about executing the sample as opposed, as opposed to static analysis and then checking its behavior, monitoring its behavior, maybe analyzing the process memory or even emulating an entire environment and then running a sample inside to have a better view of what it's doing and its behavior. So it says really, these are really the two different way to analyze a two different type of analysis that we can outline. Static, in which you do not run sample, and dynamic, in which you do. So we mentioned earlier that once you upload your malicious file to an NDS, it'll generate a report for you. So here's an example of one such report. This is a report uh, of a static scan of a malware known as BOR, which is an information stealing malware. And this report is from February of 2020. Um, this report was actually shared by the threat actor who wrote BOR, who is trying to sell it. And so this is used as a marketing material. So uh, here you see that BOR was only detected by one out of 31 different um, AV products on DINCHECK. And here's a close-up of that detection, and it actually shows you the signature that triggered detection here. And here we have a, uh, a, the dynamic scan report for that same malware sample. So here it's actually a truncated report. We had to cut some stuff out. Um, but you can see that in this case, BOR was detected by three out of 23 different AV products. So detection has gone up slightly. 
And here's a closer look at that. So one of the interesting things about the dynamic scans is that they tend to include screenshots of the infected machine after the malware has been executed. So you can see what this might look like from a victim perspective. In the course of this research, we looked at uh, about nine different NDSs. I say nine because this uh, underground um, landscape is pretty unstable. So some of the NDSs would go offline or they would you know, change names or they'd be bought by somebody else, something like that. But we, we really, uh, we looked at nine different services uh, that existed at one point in time at least. Um, all of these services offered API access and all of them offered static scans as well. Only two of the nine that we looked at offered dynamic scans, which is a little bit curious unless you start to look into how actually these scans are being conducted. So to answer that question, what we made is kind of a mock-up uh, of the possible architecture these scanners are using. Keep in mind, this is nothing more than an educated guess to answer that question. Why is there so few dynamic scanners? Well, let's jump right into the architecture of the possible architecture of static scanner. You have your classic front end, that we will, which we will not detail, communicating to the backend server, transmitting a sample in which like your uh, software that we will call the NDS controller is going to receive the sample, store it somewhere, then use the command line interface to actually order the AV to open the file and search for some incriminating patterns. As we say, this is a static analysis, you only need to open the file. After that, it will return the result of the scan, and then the NDS controller will return the result of the scan to the front end. OK, so far so good, right? This architecture is pretty simple to program, pretty scalable. It doesn't need a lot of computing power. But if we take a look at uh, the architecture that would be needed for a dynamic scanners, we run into several problems. So the beginning is the same. You have your front end transmitting to the NDS controller on the back end. But here you run into your first problem. You cannot run a malware sample into your backend server directly because it's a malware. If you do it, you're going to get infected and possibly lose some very important pieces of information. So what you need to do is actually run this into a virtual machine because, and this is also another reason for the virtual machine, you cannot have 50 different AV software solutions running in your backend server in the same machine because they're going to contaminate each other's analysis. You need to have them all separate, meaning that uh, you need for 50 different uh, AV software, you need 50 different virtual machines, which is going to cost you a lot in overhead because you need to simulate an entire system. So this is already your first problem. The second problem, if you're familiar with a virtual machine, is that you know you're going to need a snapshot to revert back to. A snapshot is basically a state, a picture you take at a system at an instant T, which you're going to revert back for each analysis. This way, they won't be contaminated by the previous one. So, and the problem is that when you cross this with the problematic of having uh, a Navy software that needs to be updated because your customers, your collectors that pay you are paying you for an updated service, you need to have your AV software updated daily to be efficient at least. So you need to come up with sort of a mechanism to every day churn out a new snapshot with an updated AV software. And you need to do that for all maybe the 40, 50 uh, virtual machines that you have and make it into a, a new daily snapshot. So you need something that, uh, so dynamic scanners are something that require more computing power and that are way more difficult to manage and administer and also to program because you need to come up with that system of updating the AV software every day. So this is part of the response of the answer why we think actually there is so few dynamic scanners. And this is something that is actually has a big impact on the price, as my colleague is going to demonstrate. So we identified three different pricing models that are used by these no distribute scanners. And the first are uh, free models. So some of the scanners are just available completely for free. Um, the, those were always static scanners that we identified, and they appeared to be supported by uh, paid advertising. So they would have like ads on them that would say something like, hey, like, do you need a cryptor? Like, come check out our cryptor, something like that. 
Then we have the paid models. So typically a site that is a paid for site will offer both of these models. So we have single and bundle scan pricing and just a normal subscription model. By single and bundle scan, I mean uh, either paying one price for a single scan or paying a set price for maybe uh, 10 scans or 25 scans or something like that. Subscription models tend to be more flexible. They may offer you, um, you know, a handful of static scans and a different amount of dynamic scans and API access, and it's good for a week or something like that. And they offer different combinations of things. So uh, for the single and bundle scan pricing, uh, there's really a huge variety of, um, of, of pricing models that are out there. So for instance, for DINCheck, uh, we found that to check, to do one static scan checking against one AV product, it costs uh, down at one cent, and it can go up from there with the dynamic scans costing more than the static scans. The subscription models, um, those also have a giant range in, in pricing depending on the different features that you want or for what length of time you want it for. But uh, for DINCheck, which we were looking at here, there was everything from 50 to nearly uh, 300 US dollars a month. So how are these services advertised? Um, these services are most popular or most popularly advertised at least uh, in the Russian English language cyber criminal underground. So typically on forums. Um, here we have a snippet of an ad for Scanhaven, which was actually recently rebranded as Czechzilla. And they say, uh, at Scanhaven, you can scan your file on 39 fully licensed antiviruses, which include daily automated database updates. We also have a screenshot here of an ad for Spiral Scanner, which is a static scanner. And you can see it's got this kind of like mysterious graphic and like this, you know, the red writing and stuff. Um, and this is uh, especially common on the English language underground using these kind of flashier graphics to grab attention. So let's take a look now at what is the role actually of NDSCs in the criminal landscape, cyber criminal landscape. First, we're going to examine how are NDSCs directly used by malware developers. So uh, to talk about that, we outlined sort of three different stages in a malware life, possible stages, should I say, because not all of them have to be present, development, advertisement, and exploitation. Of course, not every malware developer is going to advertise its product. Also, we know that uh, some cyber criminal gangs, such as Roll Digital, according to Trend Micro, had their own no-distribute scanner. And we, as a research community, are aware that modern cyber criminal gang uses NDS for their activity. So with that in mind, let's jump right in into the development part. When you develop a malware using an NDS to make it more undetectable, you're going to run into that kind of sack of cycle, meaning you're going to test your malware, analyze the output. If it's not detected, well, hooray, you have a great malware. If it is, you need to identify the cause of detection, remedy it, and then test your malware again. But how would that look in real life with a concrete example? Well, let's say I'm a malware developer. I program my malware, I submit it to DINCheck, and I see this result. Avira Internet Security detecting my uh, software, my malware, with this signature. I can go on Avira's website and see if there is any information about the signature online. There is, and it tells me that it's a signature that is supposed to be triggered when uh, software modified the MBR or when it makes a copy of itself in the, these two different uh, files. This way, I can inspect my malware. Is it uh, checking something in the MBR? Is it modifying it in any way? Is it uh, using these two paths? Are they hard-coded in them or not? This is the kind of question you should be asking. Another very good way to escape static detection, of course, are cryptors. So here you have an example of legitimate and also totally uh, tools that are totally for criminals only to hide their malicious intent. You have Femida and Spartan Cryptor. These two are very useful to es uh, sorry, escape static detection, meaning that you will encrypt your malware and put it to stub at the beginning when you execute a newly created executable, it will decrypt the whole, the stub will decrypt the whole thing and then execute the malicious payload. So this is how this would work, how you would escape detection, the static detection at least. 
Now, if you come to actually finishing your malware and you want to sell it, a crucial part of that is actually advertising your malware. So what people usually do is that they actually trans they show uh, an example of one of their malware running against an NDS and saying, look, my malware is a quality product. It's only detected by uh, three security vendors out of 45, which is pretty good in my opinion. Here you have uh, some screenshots of uh, people selling or advertising rather uh, information stealer. You have Kpot, you have Bohr, you have Diamond Fox and Oski. So they go on marketplaces and forums and actually advertise the product by linking uh, a link to the analysis. This is one way to advertise a malware. Last but not least, using an NDS to actually monitor the AV editor's response. This is something very important after you develop your malware, after you choose to sell it or not, and you did it actually, you are going to have to exploit your malware in the wide. To do so, NDSs have, very, have two very useful features, which the first one is periodic scans, meaning, for example, uh, a threat actor is going to be able to scan its piece of malware every five days. And every five days, it's going to be assured that his malware is still undetected, undetected. This is something that is very powerful, in my opinion, because it allows uh, threat actors to constantly stay ahead of AV vendors, meaning that if there is detection one day, they can circumvent detection quickly by identifying the cause and then churning out a new release of the malware and set it again or use this new version. This is something that allows them to stay ahead of the game that malware editors have been playing for so long. Another feature are the main check. If you are about to launch a campaign, the last thing you want is use a C2 that is already blacklisted, right? So the main check allows you actually to um, check a certain uh, list of URLs or hosts or domains against blacklists that antivirus vendor uses. This way, you can be assured that your campaign is not going to fail because your C2 is already blacklisted somewhere. So let's take a look now at some less obvious actually uses of NDS. NDS integrated into CrimeWare tools. So if you look at your right, you have an example, uh, a screenshot, sorry, of CyberSeal, a crypto that embeds CyberScan in it, which is NDS meaning every time you're going to actually encrypt a malware with this, the result of this encryption is going to be automatically checked against CyberScan to see if it is statically detected by AV vendors. In my opinion, this is an incredible option which allows uh, threat actors actually to streamline the process of encrypting something and then checking if the packed result is actually something that is detectable or not. This is something that is potentially very harmful. Uh, this is why every NDS we surveyed actually um, have an API, an application programming interface. This allows for automation and integration of tools. At the center of your screen, you have a screenshot of uh, DinCheck's GitHub, which uh, have PHP resources and example to show you how to use their API, actually. Last but not least, NDS, some NDS, we know that Scan4U did it, and now it's successor and, successor and stem of scale and successfulness, maybe, uh, is uh, Dinshek. They actually propose to be the back end of other NDSs. So they actually, it's on Dinshek official website. You can actually become partner distributor if you wish to have your own NDS server, NDS service, and you do not want to build your back end. You can actually ask Dinshek to do that for you. Let's jump to the key points. What do you have to remember from this presentation? So uh, antivirus is not a panacea against malware. This has been said, but this will never be said enough. Although we must uh, uh, remember that these are scans that are not made with uh, internet enabled usually, so meaning that the whole cloud computing aspect now present in AV vendors will not be taken into account during the analysis, making up analysis a little bit less uh, real, as it will be in the real world. So yeah, 
if you could excuse this typo, antivirus doesn't stop all threats and threat actors are um, actually monitoring what AV vendors are doing. Another takeaway from this is that um, it's important for us to identify the big players in any type of cyber criminal ecosystem, as always, right? So um, when we look at different types of um, cyber criminal services that are available, it is important that we keep NDSs in mind and identify who are the major um, sites and players out there. Uh, that was at one point scanned for you, which again was taken down. And uh, now, I mean, you've heard us mention DINCheck multiple times in this presentation. There are others as well. But this helps us better understand as researchers and defenders where to invest our time and our resources. And uh, finally, malware authors are giving us a very interesting gift when they share these uh, AV scan results, or when they share these NDS scan results, rather. Uh, we're allowed to take a look at these and see, OK, what is um, you know, bypassing antivirus? What is really you know, getting through the cracks here? And it can allow us to better identify you know, what's really an up-and-coming malware, what's really potent, and what should we prioritize uh, being prepared to defend against. So thank you everyone for uh, attending today and I guess we'll open it up for questions now.